Hi guys and welcome to this video. In this video I'm going to talk about the Citizen 8110A chronograph movement and this particular watch which is commonly referred to as the bullhead and of course anybody who is a movie fan uh, will recognize this particular design the gold case black bezel the dial is actually an aftermarket one on this one there never was a yellow dial this the original one would have been gold this particular one right here is the um, steel case and the silver dial as you can see and i'm a big fan of this movement i'm a big fan of citizen movements in general while Seikos are very nice, the 6139 does have some limitations and is underjeweled for what it is. And the 6138 is a much, much nicer, much better movement. Uh, it's not just the addition of the continuous uh, hour counting dial. It's, uh, it's also internally... Uh, improved over the 6139 it's, it's a better movement although it is very very similar in many many ways this obviously uh, these are still a bit of a bargain in comparison to vintage Seiko's but the prices on them are increasing uh, thanks to Mr Brad Pitt and his wearing of one in Once Upon a Time in America and uh, if you like chronographs and you like Japanese chronographs, I highly recommend that you look for one of these. There are other variants with the pushers and the dial at the side, and then you would have the windows top and bottom, the day and date would be over here at the three o'clock position. Just like the Seiko, if you're comparing a bullhead to, um, to uh, the UFO yacht, uh, yachtsman or the, uh, or, you know, the Kakume or, or the um, the jumbo or anything like that and um, while they may not be as bold in design with the exception of the the bullheads uh, while the, the others may not be quite as bold in dial design they are excellent movements they're a high beat movement 28,800 VPH and they have um, bi-directional automatic winding just like the Seiko. Uh, the Seiko system is a more efficient system and they're just incredibly good. They're really, really good. And another feature, another thing that I really like about these over and above your uh, Seiko, where I'll show you on this one because obviously this one is needing work and as you can see, it's, it's very lethargic and not doing what it should at the moment. It's barely running, but I'll demonstrate on this one. If you, you can start and stop the chronograph ordinarily as you normally would, but this also has a genuine flyback feature. So while you will read the term flyback lever on chronograph documents, a genuine flyback chronograph is a chronograph that will snap back to zero whilst running. And then as soon as you release the reset button, it will continue running like this. So you can do instant lap timings on them. So for example, you time a lap, 10 seconds, boom, and then start again. And it will just immediately start timing again from that reset like so. And I think that's a fantastic little additional feature. And it's something that you cannot do on any of the Seiko movements and on the vast majority of Swiss movements, they are just designed in such a manner that the reset is blocked when the chronograph is running and you physically cannot reset it unless you stop the chronograph running. So hopefully this video is going to be useful to, uh, to the folks who are interested in this particular movement because unlike the Seiko, there's not an enormous amount of information um, available online or in document form for this particular watch, which is a little bit of a shame, but I'm just going to go ahead and open up the back. There we go. And there you can see the movement with its automatic winding weight. And 
you can see it has a, um, a, a, fine ch uh, a fine adjuster on the balance which is also a nice little touch. The automatic winding system is encased under this little bridge here so you have a, a transmission, you have your drive gear on uh, on here, a, an intermediate wheel and then your two reversing wheels here under this little bridge. So it's a nice little compact unit. Here is the bridge with all the chronograph works underneath and once all this is removed you've essentially got a standard sort of layout as you would have in a citizen watch underneath that but obviously we'll see that as we get further into it. So uh, without further ado I am going to remove this piece of floating detritus that looks like a broken date click spring or something similar. Hmm, that's interesting. We'll see what uh, see what that is and, and where that's come from. Um, but we're going to get this uncased and, uh, and start stripping the movement down and take a look at the, um, the intricacies of it. Disassembly begins by removing the oscillating weight. This is screwed down onto the center post and you can get a special tool for removing this because it's not a typical slot. But a pair of sturdy tweezers will do the job perfectly fine. The stem is removed in the conventional fashion by depressing the plunger for the setting lever and then the movement is uncased. Here I'm reinserting the stem just to align the hands to aid in uh, hand removal. And as is usual, my preferred method of hand removal is with hand levers. I do occasionally use a Presto tool for some hands, but uh, the bulk of the time I prefer to use hand levers as it offers more control. The small hands on the subdial, as you can see, can sometimes put up a little bit of a fight as there is very little clearance underneath them, so it does help if you have very thin hand levers. With all of the hands removed, the plastic casing ring snaps off the movement. And note the half round section here, which locates into a specific part of the case. And there are actually two positions this could go, so it's important to note which one that goes into. The dial is then removed by undoing the two dial feet screws on the sides here. And with a little bit of encouragement that lifts away. Here I'm just showing the dial spacer ring which sits quite nicely on the dial and doesn't need to be removed unless you have a reason to do so. And there I'm just demonstrating the rapid day change mechanism. I do have a separate video covering the rapid day change mechanism in detail for those uh, interested. The day wheel lifts away uh, much like a Seiko with a snap ring and then it just lifts clear. And then we can begin disassembly of the dial side starting with the rapid day change star wheel.
and then the cover plate which holds the calendar ring in place is held with four small screws of equal length Once these are undone, the cover plate lifts away. And then the jumper and combined spring, and then the calendar wheel itself can be lifted clear. This is a two-part gear with a metal upper and plastic lower which can be separated that snaps together as you can see and this is the mechanism that moves the calendar ring around. Once the calendar works are removed there are three screws securing the dial side chronograph plate in place with this removed it reveals the reset hammer and the works for the hour counter of the chronograph Looking first at the rear side of the plate, here's the mechanism that shows the reset hammer and its return spring. This simply disengages and you can remove the hammer and then unscrew the screw that holds the return spring in place which in turn enables you to remove the arm which actuates the hammer. Apologies for obscuring the view a little there. And back to the movement side. That was the hour chronograph wheel. And then we can begin disassembling the intermediate wheel, the hour wheel, and the various time setting components. You'll note there that the cannon pinion came away with the hour wheel and there it was just refitted so that I was able to separate them to demonstrate that. This is actually a free cannon pinion as this movement uses an offset cannon pinion. the minute wheel cover followed by the minute wheel
This piece is the rapid date change for the calendar wheel. And there we have the intermediate setting wheel. Moving on to the movement side, here I'm removing the balance. followed by the automatic winding works, which is under this tiny bridge, which is held by two screws and has an intermediate drive wheel held by one large screw. Inside of this is a bushing sleeve as shown just there. And then under the automatic winding bridge are two reversing wheels. As you can see these are specific to their mounting holes and they cannot be replaced incorrectly. With these removed I'm able to release the power in the mainspring and at this point I can go ahead and remove the pallet bridge and the pallet fork. Here I'm removing the hammer spring. And this is done with the hammer in reset position. Now you'll be able to see that when you press the pushes you can see whether the hammer has tension on there or not. Next for removal is the chronograph bridge, which is held in place by three screws. And this lifts away with the reset components and the clutch and the hammer fitted to the back of it. The chronograph runner at this point can be pulled clear and removed along with the minute recording wheel. You'll note there that the pivot on this was bent and uh, unfortunately ended up breaking when that was tried to, when I tried to straighten that later, but that's a whole other story. Here I'm removing the coupling device which connects to the mechanism for the hour wheel on the front of the dial. And then the cover plate which covers the reset hammer and the clutch is held in place by these two screws. This one is the brake for the minute wheel. This prevents the minute wheel from rotating when the chronograph is stopped. With this plate lifted away you can see the hammer which bears 
on the hearts of the chronograph runner and the minute recording wheel and the reset plunger there's the clutch which actuates the chronograph runner and there's the hammer and this here is a sprung buffer system you'll note the shepherd's crook spring tried to make a bid for freedom there and this is a counterweighted sprung buffer system to reduce the shock of pressing the reset button too hard and it's quite a, quite a clever little system so that's the chronograph bridge disassembled with the exception of a capped jewel for the lower escape wheel pivot and then the click for the column wheel or pillar wheel is removed and here I'm removing the return spring mechanism for the start lever along with its pusher Here I'm removing the screw for the column wheel or pillar wheel and this is comprised of three separate components. You have the pillar wheel itself and then underneath that a washer and underneath that the crown wheel for your manual winding. next to be removed is the ratchet wheel both of these the pillar wheel and the ratchet wheel have a left hand thread screw denoted by the three lines on the screw head and you'll note I was using my brass tweezers there to hold the ratchet wheel in place whilst I remove that the escape wheel just lifts away as you can see and as that is held in place by the chronograph bridge and then the barrel and train bridge is removed and this is held in place by three screws you'll note there also that the barrel arbor is jeweled this has a fixed winding wheel on as you can see there and this wheel and the fixed winding wheel on the bridge form part of the automatic winding works this third wheel that you see here as you can see it has a uh, spring tension slipping system and this is the wheel that drives the minute recorder the mainspring barrel lifts away as you can see and you'll note that the second wheel won't lift away at the moment because that's still held in place by the off-center cannon pinion here I'm showing the driving mechanism on the mainspring barrel for the hour wheel this protrudes from the dial side and drives the hour wheel gear and the mainspring is removed conventionally There's the offset cannon pinion, at which point the second wheel drops clear. And here is the cover plate and the mechanism for the rapid day change, which operates via the reset button for the chronograph with the stem in date setting position.
Again, there's a separate video on that should you wish to look in more detail at how that operates. And here we're removing the keyless works. So we've got the setting lever spring followed by the setting lever and the yoke. which has a built-in yoke spring, similarly to Seiko. This small L-shaped spring is the spring that operates against the rapid date change and allows that to pivot back and forth. And here we're removing the winding pinion and the clutch, and then the winding stem. And finally, refitting the balance in preparation for the cleaning machine. So, thank you for watching. I hope to have the rebuild uploaded soon. And we shall see you there.